Good morning, everyone. It's good to have all of you with us. We do have visitors with us, some who are here regularly, and we're grateful for your presence. Uh, there are some here, perhaps for the first time. If you haven't yet filled out a visitor card, we hope that you'll do that before you leave. Uh, but I'm really grateful to have visitors, the holders, with us today, uh, David and Susan. Uh, David's my hero in a lot of ways. Uh, I greatly respect him. Uh, there are a lot of men in everyone's life that I suppose influence you in the things that you do, but David has been a profoundly good influence for me, and I, I thank God for him, and I'm uh, grateful for him to be here this morning, and I'm scared to death that I'm getting ready to preach in front of him, but, uh, but anyway, I'm really glad that you're here. In our reading, we've been covering the, the life of Jesus, and we have embarked now in the book of Acts to the stories of Scripture that show us how the gospel grew. But I want to go back to John chapter 18. We're, go we're going to be reading from there in just a second. Because we're entering, when we come to the, toward the end of John's gospel, the story of Jesus' life, he had just finished praying in John chapter 17 for himself, for the twelve, and for those who would believe in Jesus through their word. And the events that then begin to unfold in the Gospel of John, as well as with the rest of the Gospels, is events that transpire very quickly. It seems they flow from arrest to trials and to, then to his death, of course, on the cross and his burial. And, of course, all of the Gospels end with the story of resurrection, which is for us the pinnacle story of what makes Jesus the Christ. But there are things that are going to come up in our reading that we want to focus on this morning. And one of that is this idea for which Jesus came. What, what is the purpose for which I came? And throughout Scripture, several times in his ministry, he tells us. Uh, the first thing he tells us is to fulfill the law and the prophets in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. To proclaim the good news of the kingdom, he says early in his ministry in Luke chapter 4. To bring division and a sword, he will say in a different context than Matthew 10, and to call sinners to himself, Mark chapter 2, verse 17. To do the will of the Father, he says in John chapter 6, and then to serve and give his life a ransom, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. To bring abundant life, John's gospel will tell us in chapter 10, and to seek and to save the lost, Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, and last in the prayer, to glorify his Father and be glorified. That is the summation of the purposes for which he came, but there is yet one more that we're going to talk about in our reading this morning. So begin reading with me in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden into which he himself entered and his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. So he was saying to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. Therefore, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, therefore, he asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. So Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the word of the, so that the word might be fulfilled which spoke of those whom thou hast given me, I lost not one. So Simon Peter therefore said, therefore having a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. Jesus therefore said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And led him to Annas first, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. And Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. And now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. 
But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought in Peter. The slave girl, therefore, who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold, and they were warming themselves. And Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. And the high priest therefore questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I also taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. Behold, these know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the officers standing by gave Jesus a blow saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if I had spoken wrongly, bear witness of the wrong, but if rightly, why do you strike me? Annas therefore sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself again, and they said therefore to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter therefore denied it again, and immediately a cock crowed. And they led Jesus therefore from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the praetorium in order that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, he would not have we would have not delivered him up to you. Pilate therefore said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death, that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying but what kind of death he was about to die. Pilate therefore entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? And Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you up to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered up to the Jews. But... As it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Pilate therefore said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king, and for this I have been born. And for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my name or my voice. The dialogue between the characters in John 18. You have the story of Peter and the other disciple. You have the story of Jesus with the falseness of the, the court of the Jewish tribe of Caiaphas and Annas. And then you have, of course, the conversation for which we often focus about with the great leader Pilate and what seems to be a, a very uh, harsh and callous view of Jesus's predicament. But perhaps John intentionally puts together the narrative in the order that he does by separating the events as they are unraveling, by moving from Annas from Caiaphas, which he spends little time really talking about the Jewish trials, then goes out to Peter and tells us about how Peter is about to deny Jesus. Then he shifts back to one conversation that occurs with the, the Jewish trial, and he, then he shows us the final blow that occurs with Peter falling prey to temptation and denying Jesus the third time, fulfilling what Jesus had said would happen, and then the conversation with Pilate. And notice when Pilate comes in to ask the question, what have you done? 
Some commentaries will say that Jesus does not answer him. That is, what have you done? And, and his immediate reaction is to say, my kingdom is not of this world. And so he defers for the moment to answer the question that Pilate has asked. Because what Pilate is searching for is an answer that Jesus cannot give because Jesus has not done anything worthy of the accusations that have been made against him. But what Jesus has done is come into the world for the purpose for which he was born to accomplish what God needed. And that's going to be the final answer that Jesus gives. But I want you to think about how all of this develops. We're told at the very beginning of Judas leading the mob out. The grouping of soldiers, probably anywhere from 200 to 700, 600, would have been the amount of soldiers that are associated with this groupings that John identifies, although it's unlikely that all of them came out at the same time. Even you and I, when we would say that the fire department put out the fire, we don't usually mean that every firefighter in the entire department was there at the fire putting out the fire. We will say whatever department 51, they put out that fire. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of them are there. But this is the thing I want you to see. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, he did not stay in the city. He stayed in Bethany, according to Mark's gospel. It could have been for him an easy escape from what was mounting to be the most eventful week of his life. Also, while Jesus was in the city, he's surrounded by lots of people because according to Josephus, at any of these religious festivals that God required, there could have been millions of people, a million people within Jerusalem as visitors. And it was a cold night, if you remember, and they were burning fires. And Jerusalem would not have been a modern city like you and I think of a modern city. There wouldn't have been street lights. So there would have probably been, in the coldness and the dampness of the night, a darkness that Jesus could have escaped into when difficulty came. And so when John 18 tells us that Judas comes, John intentionally tells us that Judas comes to the spot where he knows Jesus will be because Jesus goes to the spot where he has always gone. And notice Jesus knowing what's about to happen. There is nothing that he is doing that would give him opportunity to escape or to throw the scent off Judas from finding him. Jesus does everything that can be done to make possible the fruition of this purpose for which he came. Jesus is out of the city. Jesus is in the dark. Jesus is able to flee. And when the mounting of that group coming out in the darkness to arrest Jesus, he could have heard them coming in the darkness of the hour, and he could have fled. But he does not. Because his ultimate answer to Pilate is the driving force the moment of that hour. And that is for this purpose I came. And the first thing I want you to think about is Jesus willingly died. Engaged in this ful fulfillment of God's purpose. Because he loved us. Jesus stepped into the pro process deliberately. In complete control, we will always observe. And he does not ever seem to, while he is praying, according to Luke's gospel, in, in, in much distress, let this cup pass from me. But there never seems to be a begrudgment on his part that this is the task to which God has called him. He even knew what Peter had said earlier, if you remember the very thing that leads Peter to deny him, the promise that Jesus makes. Lord, where are you going, he asks. And Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot come. 
And so Peter said, then why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, would you? You'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. So Peter's shock must have been extraordinary in Jesus' revelation of what's about to happen. And I want you to realize that Jesus knew Peter better than Peter knew Peter. Just like Jesus knows you better than you know you. Jesus did this because he loves us. And he loves us in spite of what he knows about us, in spite of what he knew about Peter, and promising Peter, I know that this is what's going to happen. Still in the moment of John chapter 18, when Peter takes out the sword and slices off Malchus' ear. I suspect that there may have been in the voice of Jesus a gentle reminder and a gentle rebuke about what it was that Peter was doing and misunderstanding. But notice Jesus does not turn him away in rebuking him. Notice Jesus does not cast him aside as if somehow he has now become an inferior follower of Jesus, but Jesus chides him in his misunderstanding of what is supposed to happen. And Jesus is still going to die for him. Because Jesus knew the temptation that we all feel, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 4, verse 15. Tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He knows, because he is the Lord, what is in man. The psalmist says in Psalm 139, verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me, and you have known me. He knows the masks we wear. He knows the pretend answers we give. He knows how our minds think, and he knows the difference between what we say and what it is that we really do. But yet, Jesus still loves us, because he still loved Peter. Isn't Peter's story your story? We fail to understand God's ways just like Peter did. And God says, or Jesus says to him, you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. We fail to recognize our own weakness just like Peter did, who could never even imagine that it would be possible for him because he says, I will never fall away. But three times he will deny the Lord. The wise man said a long time ago about all humans, including you and me, that pride comes before the fall, Proverbs 16, verse 18. And in that experience that Peter shares with Jesus, Peter sees and will feel why it is Jesus came. We fail to fear God sometimes more than we fear people. Just like Peter when it was the relative of Malchus who sees him at the fire, John says. News must have been spreading, or at least Peter was thinking that it was spreading. And then the rooster crows. Jesus still came. And Jesus still died. I have come that they may have life, and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So when he spoke to Pilate, for this purpose I was born, flooding through what could have been his human heart, was the true experience of what it meant to love Peter in the darkness of that hour. Because it is the other gospels that tell us that Jesus looks down and sees Peter and Peter sees him. And Peter went out and whipped, wept bitterly. But there's something else about this. And that Jesus willingly died because he was in control and he was king. So when Jesus tells Pilate, for this I have been born. For this I have been born. He acknowledges the question to which Pilate really wants to know. So you are a king. And Jesus says, for this, this is the reason I have been born. Jesus came to be king. 
Jesus came to establish his kingdom. It was the purpose for which God came, and there was no human who could get in the way of God's purpose. In our religious world, there are so many people who tell us that the kingdom was delayed because the Jews rejected Jesus, and so God is going to wait to establish his kingdom at a later date. How could we even suppose that idea when we would suggest that Jesus is not this great and powerful king fulfilling God's purpose and doing it standing before Pilate and said, I was born for this day to be king. The problem is, is we don't understand what that kingdom is. But Jesus did. My kingdom is not of this world. For if it were, my servants would fight. Jesus willingly died because he had come for this purpose to be king. And to be king over his kingdom. His sovereign right to rule is because he is God and God's son. Do you remember in Daniel chapter 7, in the vision that Daniel saw, Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And when he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him and to the him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him, his dominion is everlasting, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. But what Pilate was looking at was a common Galilean, a man wearing no jewelry, a man wearing no extraordinary clothing that only the royalty would wear. He wasn't even a man who walked in and appeared before him surrounded by servants. He was just a common teacher. And Pilate could not see the kingdom that Jesus had come to establish. And someday, Pilate, along with Caiaphas, along with Caesar, along with Annas, and everyone else who lived in that day will see Jesus coming again in the glory of his Father with all of the angels. And they will bow down to him as king. And, of course, the lesson is this. If that is the purpose for which Jesus came to establish his kingdom, why aren't you obeying him? If he is the king of kings, if he is the Lord of lords, if it is the purpose for which he came, as he stands before Pilate and says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. But this is the purpose for which I have born. Why are you not a child of the kingdom today? If he is king. And if you are a child of the king, why are you not obeying him? Jesus says in John chapter 18, you say correctly that I am a king, and for this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth, and everyone who is of that truth hears my voice. But what was the other purpose for which Jesus came? Notice he says, to bear witness to the truth. Jesus willingly died because not just on the fact of how much he loved us, not just because he was the king, but because there was a truth that he would serve. Sometimes we grow impatient with changes that we are witnessing in our world, like John MacArthur wrote in a book to, in 2007 called The Truth War, who would have thought that people claiming to be Christians, even pastors, would attack the very notion of truth, but here they are, end quote. And it is, it is a radical and, and true statement to observe that in our religious world, even beyond and among those that are those professing to be Christians, is there perception that, Truth really doesn't matter. It really just only matters how you feel what it is that you want to accomplish. But the truth is the battle about truth has been perennial. It began with Satan tempting Eve with a lie that undermined God's truthful word. 
by saying, that is not really what God meant. And a lot of times you and I need to understand that as soon as someone tells you, that's not really what God meant, they might be misleading you. Especially when God says in his word, baptism now saves you, and they're going to tell you, oh, but that's not really what God meant. The absolute truth for which Jesus came was to serve the truth that was divine. To yield to the word for which God had purposed everything to be accomplished. Here is Jesus' claim showing that our conceptions of truth, when they're constantly shifting in our postmodern philosophy, that for Jesus and the way that he acted, there was absolute, objective, knowable truth that had to be yielded to in the spiritual realm. It is not whether you feel it's true or not. It is not whether you like it or not. It's not even whether you believe it or not. Spiritual truth is not determined by pragma pragmatism. It's, oh, well, it's true because it must work. If God has spoken it, that is it. And that's what Jesus was trying to awaken Pilate to. And I think his response wasn't genuine. I don't think Pilate was trying to go down the path to become a Christian. You may feel differently. That's okay. But I think Pilate understood what Jesus was trying to say by asking the question, what is truth? So when the Bible calls God the God of truth, Psalm 31, verse 5, or it is impossible for God to lie, Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, that as the eternal being who created everything that exists because he is spirit, when he announces in John chapter 1 verse 14 that Jesus, the word who is God, full of grace and truth, has appeared, this truth characterizes the reality that God is here in his son to establish his kingdom and to show you his love. Are you listening? John chapter 3 verse 21 says that if we are, we'll practice the truth. If we understand that, we'll understand as Jesus prayed in John 17 verse 17, that the word that has been revealed as God's, that is the truth. Sanctify them in thy truth, thy word is truth. And we are to worship, as Jesus told the Samaritan woman, in spirit and in truth. If Satan is a liar and the father of all liars, in contrast to Jesus, why would we think Jesus then is describing for us a lottery description of living a life as a Christian? Just kind of live the way you choose. So in our text, we come to this final realization. When Jesus came into this world, he came with a very clear and distinct purpose. It's to show you not only that you are loved, but to show you how he would love you. And that is to give up everything so that you could be right with God. That he would come into this world to accomplish the purpose of his father and ascend to the ancient of the days and receive from the ancient of days the kingdom that would be his. That he would reign upon for out throughout time. So when Jesus says, I was born for this purpose, listen carefully, because he was born for that purpose for you. Do you believe that he loves you? He's shown you that he does. Do you believe that he is king in his kingdom? He was raised by the power of God from the dead and raised before the apostles to ascend upon high and delivered on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit that showed to the world that God was speaking through them. Will you believe it and listen? And will you believe that Jesus means it when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me purpose for which he came is you. And once you respond to him,